Thank you. So, uh, in this talk, I'd like to speak about sheaves on graphs and some of their applications. Um, to begin this talk, I want to go not on sheaves on graphs, but go to more general sheaves on discrete structures. Um, so to motivate that, before we specialize to graphs, um, there was a sort of dream in the 1980s with a thesis of Michael Benor that you might be able to solve P versus NP or other problems in complexity theory if you could concoct a sort of Boolean complexity theory cohomology. In other words, P versus NP is a question about Boolean algebra. And instead of attacking Boolean algebra, it's sometimes easier to attack algebraic algebra, where you study algebraic functions and you try to prove that certain algebraic functions can't be computed quickly. Um, so this was done um, notably by Michael Benor for uh, higher cohomology classes. And it's still sort of a dream of mine from the 1980s that there might be such a theory. So I look for such a theory when I can. And if you're going to look for cohomology theories that might work in Boolean algebra, you're sort of naturally led to Grothendieck's work on Grothendieck topologies. There is a secret that few people know, which is that Grothendieck's work is actually very, very easy to understand when you start reading it. You get so general and um, so sort of all-encompassing that it's sort of a natural place to look, uh, especially when you have very few open sets like you do in algebraic geometry or in Boolean algebra. So I became interested more in sheaves on graphs, um, particularly when I learned of the graph theoretic statement of the Hahn and Neumann conjecture. And I still find more interesting things about sheaves just on graphs alone. I have some friends who are algebraic geometers, and they say, aren't graphs those kind of one-dimensional things? And I say, yeah. And they say, you're interested in graphs? And I say, yes. There, there, there are some interesting invariants, and I think there's still a lot of interesting things to do with sheaves on graphs. So the simplest way of thinking of a sheaf on a graph, or one way is if you know algebraic, ge algebraic graph theory, it works with functions on the edges of a graph, functions on the vertices of the graph, and so on. And a sheaf on a graph simply means that instead of having one dimension for each edge and one dimension for each vertex, you can have different vector spaces associated to each edge and vertex. You might have zero-dimensional spaces, two-dimensional spaces, and so on. So in a sense, it's a sort of a generalization of algebraic graph theory. So I want to give a very quick high-level view of what a sheaf on a graph is. And I will quick, quickly sort of run away from this notion. But just to sort of say, if you know sheaf theory, then essentially you know what a sheaf on a graph is. So if you have a graph, you can look at the lattice of subgraphs of the graph. That gives you a finite topological space if the graph is finite. And if the graph has no self-loops, that's exactly the space I'm looking at. So essentially, the open sets are the subgraphs of a graph. Now, things are a lot easier because on a finite topology, it's enough to look at the sheaf on the open irreducible sets, which if you look Far enough in SGA4, you'll find almost any statement that you discover about graphs is somehow a very special case of something they do there. Um, so I will just quickly talk about pre-sheaves on the open irreducible sets, where, which is essentially the union of the vertices and the edges. Uh, and just a warning, if G has self-loops, then you're not working with a topological space, but it's something that's very close to a topological space. So now I leave all the high level definition, all high level talk, and, and just get down to basics. So a sheaf 
on a graph g comma v is given by its values, which are just finite dimensional vector spaces, one for each edge, one for each vertex. Some can be zero. They don't have to be the same. They can be very different. And uh, you have for each edge and vertex that's incident upon the edge, you have a so-called restriction map, which is just a linear map of the associated vector spaces. Um, that's what a sheaf is. For each vertex, each edge, you have a vector space, and you have restriction maps from the edges to the incident vertices. So algebraic graph theory you find in the structure sheaf for the graph, which is simply the most uh, simplest sheaf imaginable. It's just every vertex and every edge, its associated vector space is just the one-dimensional vector space over the field. And all the restrictions are the identity maps. So you can start from algebraic graph theory, where you have just this sort of structure. For each edge and each vertex, you have a one-dimensional space. And you form adjacency matrices, Laplacians, and so forth, um, just on this simple structure. Um, another very important example of a sheaf is if you have a subgraph of G, there's a natural, in fact, a very general construction. For, for any sheaf on G, you can restrict it to G prime, the subgraph, which is essentially an open subset and extend by zero, and you get a sheaf on the graph G. So the two sort of standard examples to work with as far as algebraic graph theory goes is if you have a graph G, for any subgraph of G, you have a natural sheaf, which is one dimensional on each uh, vertex and edge of the subgraph and zero elsewhere. Oops. So one of the things that's, I think, relatively new in this kind of theory is that you don't just have one graph and one adjacency matrix. Most of my living, I make studying one graph and one adjacency matrix. That's, that's fine. But the point is that if you have several sheaves on a graph, you can compare them by defining a morphism of sheaves in sort of the natural way. You have a map from all the edge spaces of the first to the second, all the vertex spaces of the first to the second, and you need to have the maps being compatible with the restrictions. So these ideas, whoops, that's not good. Oh, OK. It's back. So when you first start, uh-oh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't do this. When you, when you first start looking at sheaf and sheaf theory and all these things, these, these ideas are kind of strange when you look at it in a discrete space. So it takes some getting used to. But one exercise, and I'll start from here maybe. One exercise is if you have a subgraph of a graph, then you have an inclusion map from the constant sheaf restricted to the subgraph into the graph. This is so-called open inclusion. Um, but the morphism does not go the other way. There's no morphism the other way. There's, of course, map of spaces back and forth, but it won't be compatible with the restrictions. So you just have to get used to the way these things work. So some of the basic things you work with in sheaves is You have the vertex spaces of the sheaf, which is just the sum of the vector spaces at the vertices. You have the edge space of the sheaf, which is the same. And then, like algebraic graph theory, you have a differential, which is essentially the incidence matrix of the sheaf. You can form adjacency matrices and so on. And these all live on the vertex spaces and or the edge spaces of the sheaf. Um, 
you can define with this sort of differential or incidence matrix, you can take its kernel and its co-kernel, which are naturally the first and zeroth homology group. And then if you restrict this to, you restrict this to um, subgraphs of graphs, uh, you get the sort of the usual algebraic graph theory. So the Euler characteristic of a sheaf in general is just the vertex dimension minus the edge dimension, which for a constant sheaf works out to be just the Euler characteristic of the graph. So basically all of algebraic graph theory is found somewhere in here. One of the points, point is that if you have a subgraph of a graph, the subgraph is represented by a sheaf. So you can now compare graphs over a given graph, subgraphs of a graph, and so on, using this, this sheaf theory. So now I have a little magic show to present. It's not much of a magic show. The people in combinatorics and probability have nicer magic shows, but here is my little magic show. So you have a graph, which is a triangle. And the graph is represented by, say, the structure sheaf over the reals, which is, just has a copy of the reals for every edge and every vertex. And the restriction maps are just the identity. If you pass to a, a subgraph by taking off the edge AC, the subsheaf that you get is what you get restricting to the subgraph and extending by zero. So for every edge and vertex, you have a copy of the reals. But where you've taken out the edge, you put a zero in. So now, I want to show you that as graphs, there's no surjection from three copies of this triangle minus the edge, which are rotated around. There's no surjection onto two copies of the original graph. Certainly, there are enough edges, six edges in each, and nine vertices in the first, six in the second. But just combinatorially, you cannot have a map, because any way you map these graphs, this disjoint union to this disjoint union, one of the triangles has only one of the subgraphs mapped to it. However, in sheaves, there's a surjection. In fact, almost every map is a surjection. What does this mean? Well, when you think of graphs as sheaves, and you think of disjoint unions as direct sums, if you work this out, what this means is you have three sheaves representing the rotations of the triangle mapping to two copies of the original sheaf. But two copies of the original sheaf is really the space r squared over each edge and vertex. And if you choose, say, a vector to give you the map from the first sheaf, in other words, um, along this edge here, we have the real numbers. So the number 1 is taken to, by a vector to the space on this sheaf. So it has to take 1 to, say, to 1, 0. But what you can see is if this is connected, and it's just the constant sheaf, then once you take one space in here to, say, zero, 1, 0, every other space that's connected to it has to map to 1, 0. So an inclusion of one structure sheaf into the sheaf r squared over the triangle is basically given by a vector. But now if you choose, well, three vectors that at random, or a random matrix, then as long as these three vectors span R2, I claim that the map on sheaves that you get is a surjection on each edge and on each vertex. And there's a kernel which is basically just lives on the vertices. For example, this edge from R2, it receives contribution from this edge, which is r, and this edge, which is r, 
But this edge has been zeroed out, so the, the target space over this edge still receives a 1, 0 from the top subgraph and a 0, 1 from the middle subgraph. So that spans the space R2 and it's a surjection. Similarly, each vertex, which is an R2, is, it receives actually all three of these spaces R in the image, which is given by the map 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. And so the kernel of this is a sheaf on the triangle, means that every vertex has a kernel where you take essentially one of this, one of this, and minus one of the bottom sheaf. The point of this, of course, you can talk about general morphisms of you know, whatever you want, or fractional maps of graphs. The point is that if you have a morphism of sheaves, then you can construct a kernel, and you can apply the machinery of cohomology to this. That's the magic show. On graphs, no surjection. On sheaves, there is a surjection. And all the cohomology properties that you can deduce from this can follow. OK. So when I first heard about the Hannah Neumann conjecture, it was stated to me as a graph theory question. And the graph invalo involved um, an invariant, which is, I denote rho, which is the first Betty number reduced of a graph. So we have the common invariance, like the Euler characteristic, which is the difference of the number of vertices and edges, um, which is also the difference of the zeroth and first Betty numbers. So if the, say the graph is connected, then um, essentially the, the reduced first Betty number pretty much by definition, is the maximum of 0 and b minus 1. The problem with this reduced Betty number, if you look at the column here, is that although the Euler characteristic and negative Euler characteristic and the Betty numbers, the first Betty number, all kind of increase or decrease in a sort of nice way, um, a connected graph up to homotopy is either a tree or a single cycle maybe with trees hanging off of it, or a bouquet of two loops, and so on. But the reduced Betty number gives a tree and a cycle, or a loop, the same value of 0. This makes working with this invariant kind of tricky. So now I want to forget about the incidence matrix, or the differential. I want to forget about Betty numbers. I want to forget about L2 Betty numbers. I just want to, to define a certain invariant, which I'll call the maximum excess of a sheaf. It turns out the maximum excess is the L2 Betty number, the first L2 Betty number of a sheaf. But um, as Warren Dix pointed out in a sort of 15-page version of my 100-page proof, you can just work with the maximum excess alone, ignore anything about homology, and, and just, just define the following invariant. For any sheaf, we define its maximum excess to be the maximum of negative the Euler characteristic over all subsheaves. In other words, <clears throat> you look at all subsheaf f prime of f, and you look at the dimension of the edge space minus the dimension of the vertex space, and that's what it is. In particular, if you look at the subsheaves of a structure sheaf, it's easy to see once you get used to this mechanism that the only subsheaves there are of a structure sheaf are, in fact, structure sheaves of a subgraph. And so it's easy to see that the first reduced Betty number of a graph is actually the same thing as the maximum excess of the structure sheaf. This is not the first way I thought of the first reduced Betty number. I thought of it in terms of homological interpretation. But this is sort of a short way and a shortcut through homology and Betty numbers of just defining an invariant of a sheaf which equals the first reduced Betty number. <coughs> 
So given this definition, I want to now carefully highlight this stuff. And I want to claim that this invariant, rho, has a bunch of other properties. So the first property I claim is that if you have a short exact sequence, then there's an inequality in this maximum excess. If I told you that the maximum excess was some sort of homology Betty number, this would be clear. Because uh, for a short exact sequence, you have a long exact sequence in homology or cohomology. And then, of course, you get that the middle term invariant is bounded by the two invariants on the sides. Um, however, as pointed out by Warren Dix, you can just do this directly without any homology or anything. Uh, the other claim is that this maximum excess is additive on direct sums. Because if you have a direct sum of sheaves and you have a subsheaf of the direct sum, it just means you're giving two subsheaves of each summoned and adding them. Another property that, again, is tied to the fact that it's an L2 Betty number is that if you have a covering map of degree d, then this maximum excess scales. And again, if it's an L2 Betty number, you sort of know this automatically. So if you have a covering map of degree t, d from a graph on top to a graph below, then the number of vertices on top is d times that below, number of edges, d times that below, Euler characteristic multiplies by d. Um, the vertices and the edges have no topological meaning, because you can always subdivide an edge and so on. But the Euler characteristic does. And I claim this maximum excess is another fundamental invariant that scales exactly when you pass the covering maps. And when you pull back the sheaf on the graph below to the graph above. The other important point about this so-called maximum excess is Take a look at the subsheafs at which the negative Euler characteristic is maximized. So if you have the structure sheaf of a graph, it's an interesting exercise to see what are all the subgraphs that achieve this negative Euler characteristic maximum. But I claim that you get a, a lattice of sheaves. In other words, if you have two sheaves which maximize the excess, then you can intersect them or take their sum as they are subsheaves of some other sheaf. And because the Euler characteristics basically add up on the pairs of two sheaves, it, it's, it has to be the case that if two sheaves achieve the maximum excess, then both their intersection and their sum do as well. Once you have that, if you intersect all the sheaves at which the maximum is attained, you get a smallest sheaf. If you take the sum of all of them, you get a biggest sheaf. And another important principle is that if a group acts on a graph, then it naturally acts on the sheaves just by pushing them each vertex and each edge as does the group. And the claim is that the minimum maximizer and the maximum maximizer have to be invariant under this action. If you have a minimum maximizer, then the group action takes you to another minimum maximizer. But if it's not the same sheaf, you intersect them and get something smaller. So there, there are some formal properties of this uh, maximum maximizer or minimum maximizer. The minimum maximizer in graph theory is what would be called the supercore of the graph. The maximum maximizer is a little, uh, doesn't, doesn't have sort of an immediate view. OK. So at this point, um, I want to indicate roughly how you prove the Hanna Neumann conjecture of the 1950s uh, using sheaf theory. So the Hanna-Neumann conjecture is a statement about free groups 
But as it was explained to me, it's a statement about graphs, about finite graphs and a certain fiber product. And if you lift this to an appropriate Cayley graph, the Hahn Neumann conjecture, or the strengthened form of it, just says the following. It says, if you have a Cayley graph Z on two generators, in other words, a, a graph of degree 4, and you have two subgraphs, X and Y, then if you look at the reduced first Betty number on X intersected with the translate of Y over all translates of Y by the group, since it's a Cayley graph on a group, it has translates, the sum of the reduced first Betty numbers on the intersections is at most the reduced Betty number on X times that on Y. The translation from the two theorems is not something I'm going to really remark on. Um, I should remark that this inequality with a factor of 2, or, or this inequality with a factor of 2, was known um, for essentially since the 1950s, or as soon as it was stated. Um, my first proof that I put on the archives was about I think it was 90 pages to prove that the maximum access was the L2 Betty number, and then another 60 pages to restate a lot of the terminology and, and prove this theorem. Uh, and within a week, Minayev circulated a proof that used um, Hilbert modules and was a 20-page paper based on a 90-page paper. And then, a few weeks later, Warren Dix had essentially a one-page proof, which took from Minayev's paper a small detail and basically made it into a one-page proof based on the theory of the group of graph, graph of groups, which is pretty well known. So, of course, I did what anyone would do, which is I called my mother and father, my dad's a mathematician too, and I said, I proved this thing, I worked a long time, a long article, and now it's one page, you know. <laughs> and my dad said, it's okay, it happens in math a lot, you know, this is this fine, you know, you're doing well, just keep going with it, so. <laughs> sort of nice to have a dad in the same business. <laughs> so let me give you the sheaf theoretic proof. And uh, I apologize if I seem like I will be insulting you, but I will start off with a sheaf theoretic proof of one of the trivial cases of the inequality. So if you take x equal to z, it's essentially a, a very easy calculation, because when you intersect anything with z, you get just that same subgraph, because z is the whole thing. It's the Cayley graph. So what the left-hand side turns out to be is the sum of the reduced Betty numbers of the translates of Y. But if you have a Cayley graph and you translate anything symmetrically, you just get the reduced Betty number of Y. And the number of times is the order of the group. And it's easy to see that for Z itself, its first reduced Betty number is just the order of the group. So this is an entirely trivial case from the combinatorics of what is being asked. And to make matters worse, to add insult to injury, I'll just point out that the product of the first Betty numbers of y and z is the same thing as the first reduced Betty number of a certain number of copies of z, namely rho of y copies of z. So this is true with equality. And what you're essentially doing is taking the graph up here in red, which is just translates of y, and you're looking at its first reduced Betty number, and you're looking at a certain number of copies of z, and you're claiming that there should be an inequality. <coughs> 
In this case, it's an equality, but you claim that it's an inequality. So to make matters much worse, I'm going to give a fancy schmancy proof of this trivial case based on sheaf theory. But what happens is then the entire conjecture follows from this long-winded proof of the trivial case. So how does this work? Well, if you take the sheaf that represents the copies of the translates of G, it's just the constant sheaf. Whoops. Uh-oh. Oh, good. It's just the constant sheaf with its translates which is mapped to the constant sheaf of z to a certain power. And you can see that the numbers work out so that if you take a random map, just like in the magic, somewhat magic show, minor magic show, if you just take a random map of these sheaves, then it will be surjective. You can take the kernel and you can ask, maybe the maximum access of the kernel is 0. Because if this is supposed to be some sort of homological invariant, and you have, if you have one graph and it should be less than the other graph in a certain measure, then if, it's, if there's a surjection, this would just follow from having the kernel having zero of this invariant. And then the second graph is automatically less than the third graph. So now I have an exclamation point down here. So I want to show you, first of all, if you can do this, the general theorem follows at once. And again, with regards to my magic show, there's no general surjection of these as graphs. You can't map the translates of y to the power of z. But as sheaves, you take a random linear map, and you can see that it's a surjection. OK. So, if you're not used to working with sheaves in this way, this might sound like, well, kind of like nothing. But um, the, the way the, the proof goes is that if you have, indeed, the structure sheaf of the translates of y that surject onto a copies of z, and you have a kernel kappa, and if you can prove that its maximum excess is 0, then you can restrict this top exact sequence to an open subset, extend by 0. It's well known that that's an exact functor. So it leaves you with a sequence like this when you restrict to an open subset x. But now it just follows easily. This looks like what we want for the Hannah Neumann conjecture inequality. If kappa sub x is a subsheaf of kappa, and the maximum axis is maximizing something over kappa, then over any subsheaf, the maximum will also be 0. So we also know that for an exact sequence, the maximum excess of the middle term is bounded by the sum of the maximum excesses. And hence, it follows that if you apply this to um, the graphs, so the maximum axis of the structure sheaf is just the first reduced Betty number. And then uh, the Hannah Neumann conjecture just drops right out. So this is. I like this because you spend a lot of time to understand a trivial case, which is always the first step of anything. But in this case, the trivial case is all you need. So how does the, the proof of this go? Again, it's, it's not that hard um, sort of to describe what the steps are. And the only difficult step is maybe step number three. But the way it goes is um, you're going to map the structure sheaf of translates of y to a power of the structure sheaf on z. So just take all the powers between 0 and rho of y and see what happens. So first of all, if the power of 
the structure sheaf on Z is zero, then the kernel is just the entire structure sheaf of the translates of Y. And that, by the same calculation I showed before, is just uh, the order of G times the first reduced Betty number of Y. So you start at the power zero with a certain number. It's also not difficult to show that each time you add Y, you're essentially taking this phi and extending it and thereby sort of cutting more into the sheaf. Um, and therefore, if you look at the minimum maximizer, when you cut into it, you get something smaller. And if you have a subsheaf of another sheaf, then the minimum maximizer of the subsheaf is contained in that of the big sheaf. So it's not hard to show that this strictly decreases in A. And then the symmetry argument, which is not as simple as it, as I may make it seem here, but um, it's still sort of a general principle, is that this maximum access is achieved by a sheaf. Now, is it plausible that this sheaf for generic phi has edge dimension 3 on one edge and edge dimension 5 on another edge? No, this shouldn't happen. It should have the same dimension on every edge, every translate of an edge, and every translate of a vertex. So in fact, I claim that this, these numbers are always divisible by g, and then it follows immediately that um, once you go to a power rho of y, that if you're always positive, you have to reach 0 by the power of rho of y. So that, that is the proof, essentially. Step three is a little bit subtle because you're working with generic y's and essentially you know, a, a, a moduli of, of phi's, but um, it's not that difficult. And the, the principle is, seems quite reasonable. OK. So now I want to stress applications. The following is an application that may not seem well motivated, but I was interested in this. So we all know what it means for vectors to be linearly independent. So there's a, a generalization of this, which is if you have subspaces, a1 through a sub r of a vector space, you can speak of them being independent. And just like vectors being independent, you can write down a bunch of equivalent properties. So the basic idea is that you shouldn't have vectors a sub i in the sp spaces big A sub i, which are dependent, which, which sum to 0, unless all the vectors are 0. The other way of saying that is that if you take the natural map, which takes a sequence of vectors, a1 through a sub r, and just adds them, you should have an injection. And there's another sort of interesting combinatorial way of saying that, which is that if you take any subspace b of the vector space, there's sort of a test. And the test should always pass, which is that if you cut the subspaces by b and sum them, you don't get in dimension more than the dimension of b. If you take n random vectors, they're independent. If you take the one-dimensional span of n random vectors, they're independent, typically. And if you take subspaces of the, uh-oh, better avoid that. If you take subspaces of appropriate size that are random or generic, then they will also be linearly independent. Anything where you move to n plus 1 is forcibly dependent. So now I take this. And I want to generalize it for a reason I won't explain now to what I call two independence. So in this notion, any two n vectors that are chosen generically are two independent. Any random subspaces of appropriate size will be two independent. And the definition you can do again with a number of equivalent or seemingly equivalent ways. 
So the first way is to say for some or almost all two-dimensional vectors, I can solve the equation a sub i tensored with w sub i, and I should have no non-trivial solutions of that. What does that mean? It means that I have the sum of a sub i's times some weight, and then I have the sum of the a sub i's times some other weights. And I should have no non-trivial solutions. Or if you want, if I take the map from the direct sum into the square of the vector space, then this map should be injective. And then there's this interesting combinatorial definition which is for each subspace B, you cut the vector spaces and you sum, and it should never be more than twice the dimension of B. So I needed this for something with sheaves, and I thought, OK, this will take me about a month to solve. And uh, about four years later, I just managed to understand that although the first two, you can easily show, implies the third condition, that is to say, if the third condition is ever violated, if you get too much dimension, that you always have something in the kernel. But in fact, this third condition is not equivalent to the first two. So to very briefly explain what sheaf theory has to do with this, I'll now sort of tell you the theorems about the L2 Betty numbers. So way back when, we talked about the Betty numbers of a sheaf. And an L2 Betty number is, from my point of view, is basically you take some covering maps phi, you pull back the sheaf downstairs to the sheaf upstairs, and you divide by the degree of the covering. And it should have some limit. So the first the theorem really says that if the L2 Betty number exists, that is to say, if for a sheaf on a graph, you pull it back by a cover, and then you take the limit as a directed set over the set of covering maps, where you divide the pullback sheaf by the degree of the cover, uh, then that equals the maximum excess. That's really sort of the main idea. It's not hard to say what happens if you pull back by abelian covers. So in an adjacency matrix of a graph, this is sort of well known, if you have an abelian cover up here, then you can study the spectrum of the adjacency matrix on top. Or if you want, you can take the d characters of the abelian group that's the covering, and you basically get adjacency matrices that are twisted. So there's a sort of easy way of twisting a sheaf and computing what the limit over abelian covers is of this ratio. The theorem that I proved in this sort of first 90 pages, which I don't think, I don't know an easy proof of, is the fact that if you take the limit of this sort of limiting abelian Betty number and divide by the degree and take the limit of over the directed set of covering maps, in other words, take covering maps whose girth, girths get larger and larger, then you get um, the maximum access. And the real thing that's interesting is that the twisted Betty numbers from these abelian covers and the actual Betty numbers agree when you lift them high enough to a graph of high enough girth, which is sort of pointed out to me that it's some sort of baby theory of elliptic homology, basically. And what better way to learn elliptic homology than to look at graphs and do baby theorems of it in graphs? But the point is that if you take any sheaf, its abelian covering and its general covering are not necessarily the same. This is just an explanation I'll, I'll skip over. So here we ask a nice question about linear algebra. Uh, 
And now I pollute this linear algebra with some claim about sheaves. I have some theorems saying that there are gap sheaves that are subsheaves of constant sheaves on a graph with two vertices. You say, well, who cares about this? And the answer is that uh, this statement about, uh oh, there it goes again. This statement about, oh, that's at the beginning. Okay, still tricky. This statement in the middle about a subsheaf of the constant sheaf essentially is the exact same question. So this linear independence is exactly a question about sheaves. So to conclude, um, sheaves on graphs is sort of a beginning, hopefully, and not the end. Hopefully, we'll learn more. Um, it's an analog of algebraic graph theory, in a sense, that has additional tools. The sheaf theory doesn't always tell you what the answer to your problem is, but it often tells you where to look and gives you the tools. Hopefully, it has more foundational properties. And if you live the dream of the 1980s about p versus np, maybe it'll indicate what sort of homology, cohomology, sheaf theories may work in discrete structures. And even if not, hopefully it has other applications. So thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe uh, some questions? Laurent. Ah, Laurent. Yeah. Have you tried it for yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, just for the other room. Yes. Have you tried it for different groups? For example, right angle dotting groups? Is the same statement true? Because um, it seems the method should be applied to much more complicated things as than graphs. So yeah. like some, some cell so, complexes which naturally come associated to a right angle dotting group. Yeah. Um, I don't know about right angled groups, but I know that Warren Dix has a sequence of very interesting questions of related constants. In some cases, in, the, in a slightly more than a free group like C3 cross C3, this method gives exactly what was known, which is the, the tight bound. And with C5 cross C5, it gives exactly a totally uninteresting bound. So what I'm looking at right now, uh, always trying to generalize this to other structures, but even with just groups that are slightly more than free, how this method works. And sometimes the symmetries and the strict decreasing gives you actually nothing. But hopefully there's something there that I don't understand. And in a few months, a few years, I'll be able to say more. Other questions? Well, if not, let's thank uh, Joel Friedman again. <laughs>